Hello, I'm John Stevens. I'm the chair of the Federal Trust. And I'm talking today to Geoffrey Martin, who used to run the European representation in London, and before that ran the uh, European representation in Belfast, during which time he was very heavily engaged in the peace process, which led up to the Good Friday Agreement. And I want to talk to him about his views on recent events in Northern Ireland, in particular, obviously, the fact that uh, the Stormont Assembly has collapsed again, and we're now due to have uh, another round of elections. Jeff, the issue of the Northern Ireland Protocol has become absolutely critical for the way in which Brexit plays out. How significant do you feel for the overall relationship of the UK with the EU, and in particular for what is happening in Northern Ireland? has been recent events, in particular the fact that we're now in for another round of, of elections for Stormont. Well, the answer is it has become central, I think, but, but unfortunately, uh, the forces at work within Ireland, in particular in Northern Ireland, have twisted the purpose of the protocol away from what it was originally intended to be into a challenge about whether or not there will at some point in the future be a united Ireland. It's a preposterous twist of the facts and the purpose behind the original idea. So what do you think is actually going to happen in these elections? I mean, are they going to change very much? Nothing. Nothing will happen. Uh, I don't think anybody wants elections. The only reason that there are elections stems from the fact that the DUP will not enter the Assembly and the uh, legislation states that if a major party does not enter the assembly, then at a certain period of time, an election should be called. But uh, having been over there last week and having taken standings, it certainly seems to me to be the case that, that no political party, including perhaps also the DUP, won't have an election now. But on the assumption that there will be one, it's likely to result in no particular movement or change taking place. It may well be the case that Sinn Féin may have one or two more seats. Uh, the DUP might take a seat or two from uh, the Unionists, I doubt it. But in overall terms, there'll be no change and therefore the exercise will be a wasteful and expensive effort. So we'll be back to where we were. And yes, we yes you'll be, be, what is the strategy of of the British government. I and mean, we've got obviously a new prime minister, Rishi Sunak. I mean, do you have a sense of what the British government is trying to do in, in, in this situation? Well, well I, 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 I thought I did, but I listened to uh, Liz Truss answering a question from the European Research Group at her last parliamentary question time. And she was back into the old hardline conservative position of we will give up nothing. I mean, don't let's forget, John, that that the that the the Conservative Party's stance on Northern Ireland has largely been governed by the European Research Group now for a long time, and frankly speaking, not much attention has been given by the Conservatives to any other party than the DUP. I mean, I have some friends of mine in the British Foreign Office and in the Cabinet Office here in London. And one of them uh, has been involved in discussions on Northern Ireland and therefore is close to the cold face, so to speak. And he tells me that when the former Prime Minister uh, was having meetings about Northern Ireland, the only thing that she was interested in is whether or not whatever had been discussed and agreed would satisfy the DUP. I find, therefore, the situation of the British government lopsided and highly unsatisfactory. And you think this is still the case with Rishi Sunak? You don't detect any change with the new well, prime minister? Well, I think it's a bit too soon, but I mean, let's bear in mind uh, that Sunak's uh, reputation is one of perhaps a little bit more flexible than his predecessors. On the other hand, uh, with great respect to the Secretary of State and the Minister of State, they are in Northern Ireland hard-line Brexiteers, and therefore it would be very difficult for them overnight to change their position. 
bearing in mind the fact that the ideological position of the uh, ERG seems to be uh, a rampant one when it comes to sovereignty. And of course, in the context of Northern Ireland, if not in the other parts of the United Kingdom, the Good Friday Agreement broke the idea of, of, of pure sovereignty and paved the way for the entry for the first time to, to certain influences from the Republic of Ireland, which were never, were never there before the anglo irish Agreement and the Good Friday Agreement existed. So therefore, the answer to your question about what I think might happen is I don't know, nor do I think anybody else does. Uh, if, on the one hand, there is no movement on the protocol, and we can go back to that in a moment, uh, then uh, no doubt uh, the Europeans would be dissatisfied and the House of Commons might well go to a vote uh, having noted the House of Lords amendments on its legislation to move ahead and ignore aspects of the protocol, which raise fundamental points. On the, on the other hand, if by some miracle, an arrangement was reached by the current Secretary of State for Northern Ireland with the parties there, with the agreement of the Irish government in the next couple of days, and, and, and people could move ahead to accept the, the, the uh, the uh, uh, protocol, then that would open a very constructive future for all of us. But I can't see it happening. What do you think is the real motivation though? Some people have suggested that there is a fear in London um, of the impact of the protocol if it's made to work on Scotland, because there's a, a feeling that uh, conservative opinion doesn't really care about Northern Ireland. I mean, the, Boris Johnson was prepared to, to yeah. essentially throw Northern Ireland under a bus in order to get Brexit. Um, but it does fear Scottish independence. And, and the idea is that if you had a working protocol, a, um, a deal that gave Northern Ireland this special status in the EU, but also linked to the UK, that this is something which some people in Scotland, some of the nationalists in Scotland might be demanding. Do you think there's any truth in that? I do think there's truth in that. And I also think there's some truth in the growing number of people in Wales who are thinking of independence. And I say this because the government of the Republic of Ireland, uh, in addition to being a member of the European Union, uh, has been uh, holding out uh, nice branches of friendship to, and indeed opening, a consulate, a consulate in in Cardiff, a consulate in, I think Edinburgh and Glasgow and in the northwest of England, if not in Northern Ireland, in order to extend its influence within what used to be called the Red, the British Isles. So I, I really do believe, John, that although we might be sitting here in England, which has become rather isolated, there is movement going on in the periphery, which I think would affect. Uh, a Scottish uh, electorate which, which wanted more devolution than it has, and that is bound to encompass, I believe, uh, thoughts about uh, the European Union and, uh, and some form of alliance with it in the not too distant future. Yes. One of the factors uh, perhaps governing this uh, initiative from Dublin towards Scotland and, and, and Wales um, is concern over the increasing pressure from Sinn Féin, um, who obviously have a very particular vision of uh, Irish unity, um, which would also have significant consequences for the current constitution in the Republic. I mean, how great is fear of Sinn Féin coming into government? And how much does this influence both thinking in Dublin, thinking in Belfast, thinking in London, and indeed in Brussels? Well, uh, I think, Whereas there was fear, as you put it, a few up years ago, nowadays there is the beginnings of an acceptance that Sinn Féin will uh, participate in government in some shape or form in the North as well as in the South. And of course, Sinn Féin itself has changed. The men of violence and the Jerry Adamses of this world are now men in the background and their positions of leadership have been uh, taken over by some extremely bright young people in both parts of the island. 
But that having been said, I personally believe that this will not necessarily lead to a united Ireland, as many in the United Kingdom would like on some cases it to be, or in non, on other cases not like it to be, I believe that there will be two uh, different uh, Sinn Féin policies in one party. One Sinn Féin policy handling power sharing if we can get there in the North, and another Sinn Féin policy uh, involving itself in what is likely to be a coalition with either Fine, Fine Fáil or Fine Gael in the South or a combination of all three. Because the problem in the South is not a problem any longer of prosperity because the prosperity in the Republic is, is extremely marked. It's a problem of youthful expectations and the problem of housing and poverty. I mean, I attended in Belfast last week a citizens assembly. Uh, it was almost entirely populated by members of Sinn Féin. And very interestingly, uh, throughout the two hours of the meeting, and Adams was there himself, though he wasn't a speaker, throughout the two hours of this meeting, no thought or, or voice was given to the political situation either in the North or in the South. In place of that, the totality of remarks were reserved from Quinging about social deprivation, housing, welfare, and the rest. So I think that if Sinn Féin continues to campaign on those kinds of issues and leaves the violent his history of the past to the history books, then it will continue to it, it will continue to do very well indeed. What about the other side of the picture, though? Uh, there is a, a sense that there is a danger of loyalist violence coming back if there um, is some attempt to uh, have a deal on the protocol. Um, well, do you think those fears are justified? Well, it's difficult. I mean, when I was over there, which I was running the place for five years, I had very close connections with all the paramilitaries, including the Austrian Defence Association and the Red Hand Commandos. And I can say this to you very directly, John, that the, 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 the gap between what they were thinking about and what the right wings of the DUP and Unionist parties were thinking about are two different things. Many of them were looking beyond an old style divided Ireland into a wider international future. Now, whether or not that has, as it were, fallen back I don't know. I suspect that what we were just recently seeing is a bit of saber rattling. Uh, if there was to be some violence again from these people, who on earth would they be trying to fight? Would they be fighting their Protestant colleagues or would they be having a sectarian fight in the north against the people on the Shankill Road and Falls Road? I don't understand it. I think myself, this is saber rattling. I don't think they have many international friends anywhere in the entire world. And I do believe that in most cases, they're up to their necks in violence of one kind or another based on the drug culture, which exists at the moment, very deeply embedded in East Antrim, for example. Obviously at the Federal Trust, we're interested in federalism, its various forms. It, it does seem from what you're saying that the only conceivable stable future for the island of Ireland will be in some form of federalism. Um, but probably, as you were hinting earlier, in a wider context. And so just to come back, you, you mentioned the initiatives from Dublin towards Scotland and Ireland. There have been from Scotland some initiatives towards a Celtic Union, partly because the Scottish nationalists, I think, see that a close link with Ireland is a quicker way for them to get back into the EU. I mean, yeah. they don't want to be sitting in a queue behind Macedonia. Yeah. Um, and also it makes some of the issues to do with the currency and things easier. Um, and I suppose for Wales, um, it gives credibility to nations of independence, which would otherwise be entirely absent. Would you like to just say a little bit more about the idea of a Celtic Union, whether you think it is a real runner or not? Well, if you if one looks at it from a European Union point of view, rather than from a United Kingdom point of view, you will see that 
uh, hyper geographically speak, geopolitically speaking, the periphery of the European Union has been developing over the course of the last decades quite considerably. And if you use as an example, the Canary Islands, which may well be on, on, the, on the Western uh, coast of Africa, but nevertheless is part of Spain. And you add to that other islands on the Northwest and the North of the European Union, you will see collaborations already taking place which are potentially useful, both politically as well as economically. So without being too idealistic or hasty about it, I would not rule out these possibilities in any shape or form. Whether or not Northern Ireland in whatever form it takes would join that is an entirely open question for the time being. But I do believe that the periphery of the European Union is not to be ignored in the context of Scotland Wales, the Republic of Ireland, the Faroes, and so on. Do you think that uh, a unionist opinion, a Protestant opinion in, in Northern Ireland, would be reassured by uh, a context which included Scotland? I mean, after all, um, the Scots-Irish are exactly that. Um, they came from Scotland. Um, is this a factor, do you think, that could lead in the long term to stability? No, because no, and, and I've been talking to some unionists about whether or not they should open up contacts and they don't have any with Scotland and with Wales. And they just they shrug their shoulders. And it is, for example, a fact that the Presbyterian Church in Ireland uh, has left any alliance with the Presbyterian Church in Scotland over, I think, uh, matters to do with homosexuality. I mean, it, Northern Ireland has become, in the Protestant context, very introspective, dangerously so. They have no connections, even though historically, I think it was seven or eight uh, presidents of the United States of America came from Northern Ireland, and the American Consulate General in Belfast is the oldest American Consulate Consul General in the world. So you're dealing with a, a small country of or province of two million people who have become isolationist, who are frightened of the wider world. I mean, one of the people to whom I spoke was a former minister in the power sharing executive, a unionist, who said to me, look, he said, what you, what you might think now that you're living in London is that we, we unionists, uh, you know, are, are the same uh, as, as most people in the United Kingdom. He said, don't forget, many of, our, many of our members are still thinking in 17th century terms. And that's true. A few years ago, I attended a, um, a funeral in South Armagh from where I originally come and met an old farmer friend of mine and I asked him how he thought things were doing in the South. He says, Jeff, you mean the Republic? I haven't been there for 30 years. I think it's doing extremely badly. So there is a, there is a sense in which there is huge uh, ignorance in Northern Ireland. And at the same time, a growing gap between the political classes and the ordinary people with a middle class growing because of youth. I mean, it is the case that the town of Newry, which is now a city, has become extremely prosperous, largely because the border has gone. And uh, some of my friends down there were telling me that the interests of people uh, in, in, in the city of Newry, amongst the young people, are no longer in flags. They are in terms of their personal prosperity, in terms of their opening up, relig uh, opening up uh, commercial opportunities with the South. And in addition to all of that, internationally speaking, the foreign direct investment uh, is a factor which Northern Ireland Invest, the inward investment arm of the government, says ha is, a, is, a, is attracting huge attention, but is not, giving any, is, is not being given any thought whatsoever by the political parties. So there is a completely uh, complicated and twisted misrepresentation 
of what is going on in Northern Ireland by the political classes in Northern Ireland, not shared by the people who are living in fear on the one hand and in some hope on the part of the younger generations on the other. Well, Jeff, thank you very much for this um, very wide ranging discussion. Um, it's a little um, depressing, perhaps, <laughs> your conclusions. It is. Um, but uh, I, I do have some hope that uh, the, the application of a, a great more federalist ideas, both in the island of Ireland more widely, uh, notions of close connections between Scotland and Wales as well, and maybe also that would allow England to reassess its position somewhat um, and get us back on track to um, rejoining the EU eventually. Well, Jeff, just, many thanks for your time, and uh, we will continue this conversation in due course. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this latest video. It's one of a series of videos about Europe, about Brexit, and about the future of the European Union uh, from the Federal Trust. Uh, and we hope that you'll subscribe to our YouTube channel, and then you'll have notifications of future videos, which I hope you'll enjoy as much as perhaps you enjoyed this one.